Jesus went into the region of Caesarea, Philip, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, other Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of heaven of the never world shall prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, whatever you find on earth shall be found in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Today we celebrate the solemnity of the Holy Apostles, Peter and Paul. It is the Pope's Day, so it is a wonderful day, first of all, to pray for the Pope, but also to reflect on the mission of the Pope in the Church, the mission of the Vicar of Christ in the Church. Perhaps some have never asked themselves the question, does the Pope have limits to his government? Is the Pope the master of the message, or is he the first servant of the message? When Jesus lived on earth, before his uh, uh, Ascension, uh, ascension to heaven, he, he left the world. He was the Word, the Word made flesh, as defined by St. John in the prologue. The Word made flesh. The Word, the message, is something that must not be forgotten. Jesus is the Word, not only he, what, not only what he teaches, but also his behavior. He is the message. I repeat, we must not forget it, because in the Catholic Church, although some do not think so, Jesus is the first. He is the message. No one owns the message, no one, because the message is a person who is also God and who is not subject or enslaved to anyone. Jesus is the message, the Word. After the ascension of our Lord came the Holy Spirit who enlightened the minds of those apostles. He had promised, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will make you understand everything. Well, but I still the message follow for a while, not as absolutely notably, but as a consequence of the message. And so after the ascension of the Lord, we have the texts that are part of the New Testament and that we agree saying, Word of God, the letters, the letters of St. Paul, the letter of St. Peter, the letter of St. Jude, of St. John, the letters, the Apocalypse, the Acts of the Apostles written by St. Luke, the same who wrote the third gospel, the letter to the Hebrews. Those texts are part of the New Testament. There are the four Gospels and the rest of the letters are documents and also those letters where we read them a mass in the, in the first reading when we say, when we hear them, words of God. When we read the Gospel, we say it instead, word of the Lord. The letters have a message, that is to say, they have a part what Jesus had taught, but all already the letters of St. Paul and St. Peter and others, the letters begin to be a tradition, tradition, that is to say, interpretation of the message, that is what the word means. The concept of tradition, interpretation of the message, I repeat, Jesus is the message and the main messenger 
but immediately the church begins to interpret the message by applying it to the circumstances in which it was developing. St. Paul adapts the message, making it his own, and applies it and adapts to it to the Greek communities, Ephesus, Corinth, and Latin communities. Rome, for example, he adapts the message without betraying the message. It is the first interpretation. It is what we call tradition. Therefore, there is a part of the tradition that is also the Word of God, because when we read the reading of the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians, we read the fragment and we answer Word of God. Word, Christ, Tradition from the beginning, which is a faith interpretation of message, that interpretation will continue with this book, some of them of unknown authors, books of the first century, the letter of Dionetius, for example, other books of every well-known authors who die murders, the text of Saint Justine, and other books of Authors who little who little later began to interpret the word, the text of Saint Augustine, among others, among many others, or of Saint Irenaeus, or of people who lived in the east of the Emperor Saint Basil, people who lived in the west of the Emperor, that was no longer the old Roman Emperor. I think of San Isidore of Seville. Well, they were interpreters of the word. They are the apostolic fathers. Then come the fathers of the church. And then come the doctors of the church. That forms the tradition. Tradition is therefore the legitimate interpretation of the word. New situations were occurs and the word was already interpreted in a coherent and continuous way. There was never a background step. That is to say, there was never, never someone who said, You have heard that it was said to you that killing is bad, but I tell you that killing is good. You have heard that it was said to you that you cannot have vengeance, but I tell you that you can have vengeance. That never happened. The word was interpreted in a coherent way with the previous interpretation. The first consuls came where the nature of Christ was defined. The mission of the Blessed Virgin, the Church, in short, tradition is gradually enriching itself, never contradicting, contra contradicting itself. And in this journey, a third voice appears, the Magisterium. The magisterium is a part of tradition, but it is a part of tradition reserved to the Holy Father and the bishops in communion with him. And thus, we have the first three pillars of Catholic teaching, Word, Christ our Lord. The first, part of the tradition, the letters of the New Testament, which we answer, say that they are the Word of God, the, the Word tradition, how the message has been interpreted in the magisterium, the teaching of the vicar of Christ, of the successor of St. Peter in each con concrete moment. This is a catechesis, perhaps a little heavy, but it is necessary to do it. Three pillars for the teachings of the church, three pillars that are always in, in, intimately related the magisterium, the magisterium of the Pope, of the present Pope, of the past Pope, of the Pope who will co come, never, never, be betrayed. This is proof, correct? What was being taught before? Never. Never can be said, and never has a Pope said it. You have heard that my in immediate predecessor, or five centuries ago, said, but I say to you, Never because if a Pope were to say that, immediately his own teaching will be subjected to change, because if he disavows a previous predecessor, 
he is allowing a successor of his this thou him tradition and magisterium are always united and subject to the word that is why it is very important what the lord says to saint peter not only this text but today where he examines himself about his love and as there is love he changes him with evangelization but he says to him when you recover confirm your brothers in the faith confirm them in the faith the pope is not the master of the faith i say this today with pope francis i have said it with pope benedict and i have said it with paul john paul ii who are the three popes that i have come to known in a more direct way john paul ii john paul i i did not know him personally and paul the sixth I lived during his government, but I, I didn't know him personally, but I will have said, said it exactly the same and will say it with the next one. Son may find it scandalous as, I, as if I were an enemy of the Pope Francis. When I said that the Pope is not the master of the message, where we have reached in, in terms of exaggeration and barbarity if saying the pope is not the honor of the message sounds like an offense to the pope the pope is not the honor of the message because the honor of the message is christ our lord the word the pope is the first servant of the message not not the only servant but there there are also the bishops and the theologians and the people of god but the first servant is the Pope. That is his honor, his responsibility, his right, his duty. He is the first one who has to serve the message, and what we do is to be at his side, supporting him, praying for him, so that he may serve the message without betraying the mandatory he has been given to confirm his brothers in the faith, not to invent another faith, but to confirm his brothers in the faith. Let us pray for the Pope every day with the, with any Pope. Let us pray for the Pope. Let us not easy. He is the head of the Church. He has the right to our respect. He has the right to our obedience. But we have the right that he, the, that he faithfully interprets the message in such a way that that this message is coherent with the word and with tradition. Let us pray for the Pope. Let us pray for the Church. Amen.